Uh, welcome back to Business Focus here on TV3. We're live on TV channel 279 all across the world on TV3 Ghana on Facebook. Now, organized labor has called on government to outlaw layoffs to save their jobs in this country uh, during this uh, COVID-19 period. Now, the Deputy Secretary General of the Trade Union Congress, Joshua Anta, is saying it was expected that is some 600 million soft loan scheme, which was supposed to, in fact, the disbursement was supposed to start this month, and other reliefs rolled out by government will reduce the redundancy. Now, the question is whether or not we should outlaw layoffs when, as a matter of fact, businesses aren't making money or have taken a hit due to uh, this particular pandemic. I've been joined via Zoom by Mr. Ken Kumsen, who is a Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Federation of Labor. Uh, Mr. Kumsen, thank you very much for your time and good evening to you. Good evening. Thank you very much as well. Okay. And I have also been joined uh, via Skype, a big party on Zoom, also by uh, Dr. Hazel Berard Pobi Amwa, who is an HR expert. Ma'am, can you hear me? Good evening to you. Good evening. I can hear you loud and clear, Alfred. Fantastic. Great to have you both join us. We're hopefully going to be joined by Mr. Benatha, who is also a labor expert, uh, as we go on in the conversation. But before that, I want to set a good premise for this conversation, hearing from the International Labor Organization Director General, uh, Mr. Guy Ryder, who made a statement about how many jobs could be lost as a result of this uh, coronavirus pandemic. Millions, as a matter of fact. Take a listen. The destruction effect of this pandemic are actually deepening. Uh, we estimate that in the second quarter of this year, the loss of full-time jobs is the equivalent of 305 million jobs worldwide. We previously estimated that figure much lower three weeks ago go at 185 million. So I think the evidence is the effect of the lockdowns, the necessary measures being taken to stop the health pandemic is having a really dramatic effect on jobs in the world. That's exactly what the situation looks like. 305 million jobs worldwide could be lost as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. And Ghana is not left out of this already, recording cases of companies hotels, especially laying off their workers. Let me start off with you, Mr. Kumsin. Let's do the Ghana situation analysis. Uh, you are with the Federation of Labor. What's the picture looking like with the with layoffs in Ghana as a result of the coronavirus? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think that the effect, the impact of COVID-19 appears to be the worst social economic crisis that in modern history, uh, we know from the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis also had, you know, a toll on employment and businesses. But COVID-19 appeared to be uh, ravaging economies and uh, rendering a lot of uh, jobs that uh, before COVID was celebrated almost become redundant. So we recognize that uh, this is quite uncertain times and the organized labor is most concerned as to the future of the working class. So yes, if you look at aviation, for instance, planes not going, planes not coming. Uh, for the past uh, period, employees in that uh, sector have had to go home on compulsory leave, okay? Now, what conditions or circumstances that will be home is another matter for uh, as to consider. Negotiations cannot be uh, allowed to take place because it doesn't really make sense. You have to negotiate based upon uh, productivity and obviously other factors that, uh, you know, you'd have to consider. So where, where there is no productivity, what, what are you going to ask for? So we have issues where people have to take compulsory leave, like I've indicated earlier on, uh, and if you come to the hospitality industry, the hotel sector, for instance, you're also looking at situations where salaries are not being paid, uh, and so on and so forth. So COVID is actually 
it has actually caused a lot of difficulties across. And Guy Rider uh, put it in a very graphic way, saying that almost 305 million jobs will be lost over that period. So yes, uh, we can also say that right from the informal sector to the formal economy, uh, we've had these experiences. And it's, it's important that we have a conversation as to what direction we must all go to be able to deal with the aftermath and obviously the situation that we find ourselves now. Uh, Dr. Hetelawa, now some have asked whether it is legal uh, to lay people off during a pandemic uh, like this. I want to find out if it is indeed the case that there is some, there's a law that characterizes or governs laying off of people during a pandemic. Thank you very much, Alfred. And um, the first point I'd like to raise around the quality of employment is the fact that in a pandemic like the coronavirus, which was unforeseen and has a significant impact, it frustrates the very contract of employment between two parties, between the employer and the employee. When there is such a significant frustration, which was not planned or foreseen by either party, it gives grounds to the law for the contract to become null and void because the very foundation on which that contract is supposed to happen has been diluted, no more exists. So if somebody has a contract with the company which has been hit by the coronavirus, the pandemic, my brother mentioned of the aviation and leisure industry, which literally doesn't exist anymore, there was no place applying, and people are hardly using hotels. If this is the case, the very foundation which was on the onset being having to work, for example, in the airline, and the airline no more existing, means that there's no point of employment. To that extent, it's not about either party even going ahead to breach the contract. The contract itself, by law, doesn't exist. So is it right or is it perceived as being legal to lay off staff or to, be, to, to put redundancy? It's not there or there because in the context of the frustration, which is significant, the contract itself is declared null and void. I see. So uh, this is circumstantial, uh, what, tenation of, of employment? Is that, is that what the case yes. is? Yes, it is. I see. But, but then again, just as you made point that this is unforeseen. So in a circumstance like this, are the people who are laid off entitled to any packages whatsoever? At this point, I'd like to differentiate between this kind of social contract and a redundancy. When companies plan a redundancy or they foresee a redundancy, it means that they have a deliberate effort to sort of change the ways of work or change the production or the types of work that people do. And that is a foundation for a package because it is not the fault of the employee. However, the employer has preconceived this um, change in ways of work. In this circumstance, because not foreseen, and the employer itself could actually be running bank because the company is in shambles. The employee does not necessarily have a legal right to demand a redundancy package. However, in good faith and also on humanitarian grounds, the employer could decide to work out a package of sorts to give to the employee. But in this case, it is not illegal if employees are laid off without any packages. Again, I state that on humanitarian grounds, nobody wishes such a pandemic to happen. If anybody foresaw this coming, there would have been plans to mitigate it. But nobody foresaw it coming. Employers are losing capital. They are losing a lot of business. Shareholders are upset because they've lost with every investment and all that. So employees themselves should really try and find a negotiating point with the employer for some sort of compensation, if possible. But it is not binding by law for that happens. This is not a redundancy. And the redundancy in the Act of, um, in the Act 651 of Ghana, 2003 version, redundancy is one that has been negotiated with the employer by either the employee or the representatives, in this case, the union or the mother union, and there has to be notice given to a chief level officer. In this unforeseen pandemic, no such thing can happen. So it's out of the benevolence of the employer to be able to give a handshake of sorts to the employees. I see. Pretty interesting analysis you make right there. I'm bringing Mr. Kumse now. So, yes, what Dr. Hazel is saying, substantial, you know, termination of, of employment is nobody's fault. There's a pandemic. You have to go home. 
how do you react to, to, to this from the position of the law, Mr. Kumsen? I think it's quite important. I have listened to Doc, but I think it's quite important that we um, clearly um, establish a you know a matter in this case that the doctrine of frustration should be actually tempered with a bit of caution. We should appear to disturb that doctrine without doing a very detailed analysis of the issues as in sector by sector and look at the subject area, subject matter, matters and so on and so forth. Uh, you can only say that there's frustration, okay, when the subject matters, a radical change mm, in the subject matter as far as the conduct is concerned. So, for instance, aviation may say, okay, our main source of income is flight, flight grounded. But when you come to say manufacturing, say textile, or you go to mines or cocoa processing companies, you may realize that if you do a critical impact assessment, you will come to a conclusion that the impact as in what happens in the aviation and the hotel is not the same thing going through one sector to the other. Again, it's also important that we understand that the labor law section 8 of the Labor Act, okay, it provides that the employer has the right to tell it an employee. That is the right that the law actually um, has made for. That, that provides, provides the, the legal grounds for the employer, the right that has been given by the law, mm -hmm. that the employer can tell it. But in Section 15 of the same Act, in exercising that right, there are grounds for which you can exercise that right. And one is where the parties have mutually agreed to extinguish their obligation or bring their obligations to a halt. Two, where the parties, uh, there's incompetence, gross misconduct, medical condition that uh, the board of the, the SNIT or medical board have actually certified that the person can no more perform. And such other grounds provided in section 15 of the act. Now, COVID-19 or frustration in any shape or form has never been contemplated by the Labor Act. Again, in the conditions of service that we have signed with the employers, there is no single term or provision that contemplates frustration looking at a public health emergency as being ground to trigger the severance or termination of the terms of the conditions of service. So it's important that we do not appear to be creating law or in, in making a certain, uh, creating an impression that there's a position in the law that actually contemplates where we stand today. Mm -hmm. There is no provision like that. Now, what is happening, like I've said earlier on, mm -hmm. we all recognize that COVID-19 is an enemy to both the employer and the employee, okay? So the approach that the international labor organization and the UN have prescribed for us to adopt as the, 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 the approach to deal with this uh, pandemic, to deal with the excesses of COVID-19, is to dialogue, okay? Right. For the employer and the employee to sit down to discuss and look at what are the issues. Because let us not forget that there are those we call corporate predators, okay, mm -hmm. who would capitalize on COVID-19 to victimize and to lay off without necessarily, if you carry a critical impact assessment, you see that they are affected, but it is not on the main uh, the, the, the main uh, product that the company engaged in. As in the aviation, it's flight, it's down, you know. But a processing company, for instance, to what extent would you say that they are badly affected, though we recognize that, yes, observing social distancing and so on and so forth, right. comes with its own implication. But in terms of the core business, you realize that some sectors are badly affected than the others. others. So my concern, our concern is that the approach now is not to come under either uh, frustration in common, common law or force majeure at international business law. There is a need for us to look at sitting down with the employers to have a conversation on the terms and conditions of service, the ones that can be invoked, the ones that cannot be complied with, and what are the ways that we can all 
you know, uh, uh, the, the means that we can talk to make sure that we get out of this situation. But uh, let me bring you in at this point. So, would you subscribe to that position that look, there is no specific law uh, in the in Ghana's labor law concerning termination of employment as a result of a public health emergency like COVID-19? I totally agree with that because even on Saturday during the letter with Lego, and I mentioned that it's about time that we revised our labor literature to reflect pandemics like the coronavirus. Now let me put the issue of the frustration in context and to sort of elaborate a bit on what my brother was talking about in terms of the impact across different industries. Remember I made reference to aviation, which is a total example that we're all very familiar with. In terms of the labor law itself, there is no mention at all about a frustration of a contract. It is not in Ghana's labor law. Neither is there any mention of force majeure in the same labor law. However, in looking at the circumstances that are confronted by the um, coronavirus, both the employer and the employee, it is important that we begin to have a conversation around what is real and what's not real. Again, in terms of impact across different industries, if you look at aviation, if you look at mining, if you look at manufacturing of non-essential goods, those have been hit in the short term, even education. Long term, if you look at e-commerce, ICT, if you look at our break, you have those still thriving. E-commerce, they're still thriving. IT, they're still thriving. So in terms of one size fits all, I think that no corporate citizen will just get up and decide to terminate contracts without, you know, giving caution to the law. Otherwise, mm -hmm. that becomes abuse of law, and they could be sued for non compliance with the law. And therefore, the point around discussion and being humane is when all stakeholders, which includes the law themselves, the lawmakers themselves, the shareholders, other stakeholders, like suppliers, employees, sit down with them, really discuss and find out how to solve the problem. However, if you look even in Ghana today, some companies have begun to allow people to go on leave till the end of the year. Others have said, go on leave without pay, and once we're able to operate and have profitability, we hire you back. Others have said, let's suspend your contract for the period that we are not in operation. If right. the company is no more in operation because it has been so hit by the pandemic, and therefore cannot, you know, carry out its normal business. How is there itself a contract of employment? Because an employee is hired in a company to deliver a service or to, you know, work for a certain remuneration towards the achievement of a particular objective, i.e. the mission and the vision of the organization. Right. If that is not existent. That itself is not on and board. And the and law talks about the fact that that contract then, the circumstances of the contract have changed. At the time, of the sign of the employment of, um, of the employment contract, there was a promise of a job and there was a promise of a salary or duration. There was a job to be done for which the company would benefit from. If because of the impact of the COVID-19, and I'm using the word impact deliberately, there is no such condition of a color of, of employment, the issue of frustration is not one that we can decide to tamper with lightly. If there is no foundation, there's no company in existence, there is no code of employment. How can a company which does not exist or is not operational employ anyone? Exactly the point. You see, and I want to hone on to the point because, yes, there is no specific law uh, that says that employers can lay off workers a, during a public health emergency like COVID-19. But in this case, let's take a company is not working, they are not producing, uh, they are not making money. But employers would, would you say, would have to necessarily be paid because okay, there is no me, specific me, law me. about that. So, if, if that's the case, then you, you do agree that that I mean, that the employer would also have to be considered. The situation of the employer have to be considered. How do we balance it's it? It's a contract. It's a contract of employment. Okay. In a very simple term, look at it as marriage covenant. Hmm? Look at it as a marriage. Uh, a marriage between um, a marriage, you know, covenant, yes. Yeah. I you mean, cannot just say that because your spouse, your, your, your husband has insulted you, so you're going to divorce. And if you divorce, you should be given divorce the very minute that you go to court, okay? It is not easy to just break out of a contract. The, the thing about contract is that the framers of the law understand very well that contracts can 
not just be extinguished as a result of a party or a circumstance that has occurred. And in fact, to determine whether or not the event qualifies to, uh, or the, the, the contract is frustrated, it is not you and I that decide. It is the court that must decide. So mm. if you decide to terminate the appointment of, of an employee on the grounds that there has been frustration by your own estimation, he can go to court and seek uh, remedies such as the court looking into the matter to determine whether or not there's frustration or there's force my hair. So you see, that is why I don't want us to travel on that tangent. There is a recommended procedure. There's been, I know, has talked about it. The whole world, we all understand the impact of COVID-19. Nobody's saying that it has not had, it has not ravaged the economy, it has not devastated, resulted in pay cuts, and some people would have to go home. Even the aviation, some of the aviation that, uh, companies I, I spoke with, for the whole of last month, nobody had paid. So we understand the gravity of COVID-19. And we understand the difficulties that both the employer and the employee have had to deal with at this time. But the question we ask is that what would be the best approach mm -hmm. in coming out of this situation or dealing with ourselves in this situation? Are you going to okay. people to go home so, because, because of this? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the, the right approach. That's what I'm saying that. The contract of employment that the parties have signed, the Labor Act that we have that regulates the relationship between employer and right. employee. And Employee. You know, I wanted to hold on to. For which? Yeah, Mr. Kuzmin, I want you to hold on to that point of what should be done. I mean, because clearly, uh, for the lack of better expression, there may be a lacuna in the, the law concerning how such a situation should be uh, dealt with. You know, when there's a public health emergency like COVID-19. Uh, so I'm going to go for a quick break. Right when I come back, uh, we'll get into the conversation of what should be done or what the ILO has recommended so that if you're an employer out there, you're not making money, you, you, you want to send your employees home, there's a procedure. How that has to be done for you to avoid any legal tussle with your employees because you didn't do the right thing. We'll be back shortly after the quick break. Do stay. Welcome back to Business Focus here on TV3. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DTV channel 279 all across the world. On 3news.com. Share your thoughts with us. I see them coming through thick and fast. Before uh, we went for the break, we still had our guests with us in studio. Uh, on, on, on Zoom, that's Mr. Ken Kumsen, General Secretary, Federation of Labor. Uh, joining us on Zoom as well as Dr. Hazel Brad Poby Ama is an HR expert as well, joining us. On Zoom, I'm used to people joining me in studio. Forgive me. Um, <laughs> that, that's the situation there. But before we get back into the conversation, I want to show you something in the Ashanti region. My colleague William Evansinkum visited an agro processing company in the Ashanti region. They've taken a hit as a result of COVID-19, laid off a number of people, uh, even though they've just procured some new equipment. Just take a look. We're working here. Today, just a handful are engaged. A new set of production equipment has been procured to augment production, but the factory hands are idle. These are newly acquired or modern machines, but they are grounded because of lack of financial support. A little push will see these machines back to life, and that will also mean that more people will be employed. And that will mean a lot to the local economy. James Kesey, the brain behind Jackie's Agro, tells me his application for enrollment onto the One District One Factory program is limbo. All he needs is financial stimulus to boost production. Cited at Sokoban, a functional factory will mean more opportunities for the unemployed youth. Well, it's always the same situation in the Upper East region. My colleague there in the Upper East region, uh, Bill Tanko, also has been speaking to some hotel owners in the, that's in the hospitality industry in the Upper East region who are 
have been complaining about having to lay off workers as a result of the coronavirus impact on their businesses. Let's hear from them. I have 38 workers, and as I currently talk, there are only 10 workers at post just to freshen the place and open the place so that you know when you lock up a place for so long, the hazards are even more worse. So I've just left the scanty staff to keep the place refreshed till such a time that the patronage comes back and we would see how to invite the rest back and then life continue. But for now, honestly, the pressure I am getting from the workers who are laid down and or sitting at home hasn't been easy at all. They keep on calling, calling and calling just to come back to work. Some are even volunteering to come and just be around work because they don't enjoy sitting at home. But they can't come and keep sitting and sitting and sitting. Nothing to do. Simply because nobody is coming to knock at our doors. It has really hit us hard and uh, we just hope and pray that uh, something will come out of it later, as the pro uh, government has promised. That's how the situation looks like. And it's a national, as a matter of fact, global picture with uh, the ILO predicting that some 305 million jobs may be lost as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. So, Dr. Ezo, let me, let me start with you in, in this section. There's a message from one of our viewers on Facebook who's saying that can uh, business owners and uh, companies have agreement with their employees so that they go home during this period and then come back when business bounces back? And within that period they are home, what should the business obligation be to these employees? Great question. And I think it's one that every business owner should reflect on. Reason being that the law is not clear what to be done. And therefore, this is out of a mutual agreement between an employer and an employee. There are businesses in Ghana today that have such arrangements with employees where they have actually asked them to go home and then come back when things return to normal. I've always been a big advocate and a big fan of relationship and the right relationships with all stakeholders. If this relationship exists between an employer and an employee, it's an easier conversation because, again, the impact of the coronavirus is not only seen by the employer, but even employees who realize that business is not coming into it. You just um, discussed or showed um, two examples of a poor farm and a hotel where there was no business coming into it, and even employees themselves would want to work for free. To that extent, if there is a conversation with employees to suggest that we can suspend the contract of employment until the time that business returns to more normal, I would really applaud that discussion because then it means there is a mutual understanding between the employer and the employee. Other parts in Ghana as well, there are employers who have said to the employees, we're going to give you part of your salary and have a bit of money to be able to take care of itself and family until such a time that business advances back to normal and when that happens we'll return to you all that you have lost during the period my point around this conversation on COVID-19 and the impact on businesses be it private or public is the fact that there is no clear cut rule to determine or dictate to the employer what to do and at this point we can only pray and we can only hope that the relationship will be such that both the employer and the employee can agree in a way that will make it mutually beneficial for both of them and gradually transition to the end of this pandemic. It's not permanent, but temporary in nature. We are hoping that all things be equal, even by September towards the end of the year, the impact of the virus is minimal. Look at the global trend where so you have death rate, infection rate, the rate of the cleaning was phenomenal. I mean, you would have as many as 5,000 deaths a day in some of the country, right? Mm -hmm. Today, we have much lesser figures because we are heading around to understanding how to manage the process. Even when it comes to the employers' responsibility, I wonder how many employers have even taken their time to take the employees to the basic stand practices of how to avoid even getting infected. There is no point even having a promise with an employee who gets infected and even dies at the end of the period. Yes. Yes. The today, there is no right. okay. okay. Ezo, I, I, can you hear me? No I, I started getting uh, feedback from, from your end. Is it possible to probably, if there's any volume somewhere you want? Okay. 
Okay, I think it's better. Okay, I think it's better. better. Yeah. Oh, hello? Yes, hello? and the feedback is coming from the place. Like no, it's, it's, it's that no, it's, it's, it's bad. It's that it's bad. Um, but we'll try to check it out. And um, um, we'll how do you conclude on that point uh, that you were making? Uh, Mr. Kumse, you so you, you, you uh, wanted Kumsen, to so you make a recommendation so before we end it. Yeah, well, I think that um, at this time, we the, we have made, um, we joined the Ghana Employees Association to make a proposal to government that there should be an economic um, policy with a view to uh, provide some stimulus package to industry uh, as a means of mitigating the effect of uh, COVID-19. And we would want to I would want to use this forum uh, to say that the package should come quick, fast. What, what kind of package are you talking about? The stimulus package, the, 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 the stimulus million. package to support. Honestly, we are even asking for more because we think that if you look at the, the sectors that have been affected, we don't know what impact assessment that was carried out to come up with 600 million. We think that what we need there's more than that because you see, uh, there are informal economy because Ghana we have about 70 to 80 percent informal economy, and then you have big multinational in companies in the former sector, some of which are equally badly affected. So we need to do a comprehensive study, you know, analysis as to the, the the extent to which COVID-19 is ravaging uh, the the industry and mm. you know causing a lot of you know, difficulties for all of us. So, 600 million is a good start, but we think that we could, government should put in more, okay? And we can so, do that so by doing much? a real impact assessment. Well, I mean, I, I, I cannot just, um, you know, make, predict an amount, okay? I cannot make a suggestion for the amount because it has to be based, it has to be based on some figures, factors. Mm. You have to do a critical study to determine what you mean. I can say uh, 30 billion, but on what basis am I making that suggestion? Okay? You know why I'm asking so you this? That this? Because you, you, you made the point that you don't know the basis on which government even decided on this 600 million CDs. So, and you're actually asking for more. So then what that means is that then you, 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 you haven't had your answers, the questions as to how did you Real come up this 600 million. How are the how's, how's the development going to be done to companies or businesses in the country? You are with the Federation of Labor, in fact, leading member. Have you had those answers? Well, what we did was that we did um, conducted a, a survey where we distributed, we sent some uh, impact assessment forms to the various companies that employs our members. We've had responses coming from coming through. Are yet to consolidate those information and then be able to uh, look at what the figures and the real issues in terms of numbers are. That is why I'm unable to make any pro pronouncement on the basis of an uncompleted assignment, you know, mm -hmm. that we, we are carrying out. So the point I'm trying to make is that I believe strongly that we need more, even though I cannot, for, uh, for good reasons, be very exact as what should go into it, okay? So yes, it's a good start, but I know we may have to put in more in order to get the companies come out of the woods. And the idea is that, look, we are looking at the safety of jobs, protection of income. And what you must understand is that unemployment means a lot of things. It could be a national security threat. Just imagine where everybody's on the street, no, no job. Just look at what the state look like. When people go on rampage, mm. look at what the nation will look like. So the whole thing is a national security threat that we are dealing with right now. Right. Today, it may look like the person at home. Tomorrow, it may look something different. That is why we think that an intervention from the state is, 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 is one of the major uh, interventions that would help in, in, you know, in, in dealing with this uh, Issue. Great point. So, finally, uh, and 
So on two fronts, and we'll do it maybe within three minutes and we'll round it up. Your intervention, the expected intervention from government, and then also if an employer is, is watching us right now, and as a result of not making money, they necessarily have to let workers go home. What procedure should they employ? Okay, so um, thanks for the question once again. Um, from the perspective of what my expectation of them would be, as nature expect, I think that I'll be looking to what tax reliefs. I'm not sure the extent to which the AGI has engaged government on tax reliefs. Income tax reduction, for example, should be one that the government should look at. Um, I have also mentioned that there is the, the, the moment for us to really look at our labor legislation actually now. And I think that there should be a bill passed in Parliament to review the whole approach to how we're managing COVID-19 when it comes to the employee. My brother just mentioned the impact of the pandemic on the employee and his family and the whole society. And that is already a huge risk. I totally agree. In terms of looking at the possible way of making sure that even though the pandemic is huge and the impact is big in some of the parts of our industries, how do we still sustain the livelihood of people? In other jurisdictions like the U.S. and Europe, people can fly for on, can fly for unemployment benefits. What do we have for unemployment benefits in Ghana? Mm. So as an HR person, my recommendation would be on three on three on three fronts. One, right. unemployment benefits should be given to those who are unemployed, especially when they've lost their job okay. due to the pandemic. Two, we should have tax reliefs, income tax reduction, or income tax, you know, um, 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 eradication to a very large extent now. Right. Those who have loans to the banks, can we have the Bank of Ghana, the central bank, we look at the interest on loans to minimize the impact. Okay. Can we look at repayment terms, for people, especially given the fact that the impact of the pandemic is not um, permanent. You know, right. it's a temporary situation. It could last up next 12 months. But you know, how can we have those conversations with life sort of for, uh, for people? Right. The employer out there whose business is crashing. In a minute. Yes. Yes. Um, two things. Go to the government and ask for help. Right. Once you are paying taxes, once you're contributing to the GDP, go to the government and ask for help. Right. And this is where I'm interested to see how uh, a company that pays taxes and you know supports the government in every way goes to the government. The government says, Go away, I can't help you. So right. I'd encourage them to go to the government for help and also find a way of discussing with their employees right. to make life you know, easier for them. Thank you very this, much. This has been a very productive and indeed progressive conversation with both of you. I thank you so much. Thank you. And indeed, uh, on behalf of our millions of viewers on, on Facebook at the virtual platform, I want to say thank you as well uh, to those of you who watch us and the commendations to both of you about all the recommendations you made. Thank you. Dr. Hazel Berard. Hobi Amwa is an HR expert joining us on Zoom. Also, uh, Mr. Ken Kumsen, thank you so much as well. Uh, General Secretary, Federation of Labor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time this evening. And this has been Business Focus on TV3, and I want to thank you as well for making the time to watch us all across our social media platforms. I am Alfred Okansi on behalf of the team. Thank you. Stay with us as we get into the news.